Welcome to the shooting show. This week we end the pheasant season in East Yorkshire at Burke Nagness Estate, plus we go to the Highlands for a high altitude stag. We're back at the Burton Agnes estate on the last formal shoot day of the season. Although we are greeted by wind and rain, our spirits are high nonetheless. With Woodcock on the cards as well as Pheasant and Partridge, we're aiming to sign off the season in style. Preparations are already well underway. Headkeeper Nessie is back out and about, running the show in his indomitable style. We are set for a good day. Welcome to Burton Agnes. Um, I think most of you or some of you will be aware that it's last day of the season. Um, so we've sort of uh, thinned them down pretty well, so um, there won't be as many as about what there was in November, so please get stuck in. Live on your, live on your pegs, and Matt will blow a whistle to signal end at drive. Um, we don't shoot any ground game or foxes, uh, we do shoot woodcock, no greys if you can determine them, I'm sure most of you will be able to. I don't think I'll probably have to say a lot about safety but just please be uh, safe at all times if you will please. Uh, other than that, uh, enjoy your day. With the instructions complete we draw our pegs. We've assembled a star-studded line of guns today including NGO Vice President Jeff Garrard and RUAG Director Phil Unwin. Not to mention clear shooting editor and shooting show producer Wes Stanton. Within minutes we're at the first location of the day and getting the gear ready for drive number one. We're in the Burton Agnes estate in East Yorkshire. It's the place where I first started beating and uh, learnt all about the shotgun. Today I'm using the 525 Browning, uh, the trusty old uh, left-hander. And I'm using Ely VIPs, uh, 32 gram fives. It's a flat land shoot but uh, the keepers do the very best uh, to push the, the birds out and make them kill back for us. Uh, I'm looking forward to what should be a very enjoyable day. Typically the weather is worsened just as the guns take to their respective stands. It's hard to draw a bead on a high bird without getting a face full of rain. Jeff Garrett shows his resolve to take the first bird of the day. Before long this is turning into a productive drive and Jeff seems to be getting most of the action. <laughs> With the drive over the rest of the guns congratulate Jeff for drawing the best peg and all are hopeful of being in the thick of it when they move up three places for the next drive. Yeah. I think the bird's one I lost. Right, really? Yes. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm... <laughs> right, to start with, at the beginning of that drive, I thought they were going to come out this end over Jeff. He was like a, he's did. got some magnets in his pocket. They, they, they nearly all went over Jeff. We waste no time in kicking off drive number two. With the guns lining out either side of a high bank, this promises to produce some fast flying birds. Thankfully, the rain has eased off and the anticipation heightens. It's another productive drive with barely a chance to catch your breath in between each bird. All the guns get their share of the action, especially the partridges, but none more so than Jeff, who still seems to have lady luck in his pocket. The second drive uh, was ash clump. Uh, there's a big corner uh, planting of uh, elephant grass there. It went really, really well. Uh, 
Jeff Garrard once again got all the shooting. Uh, however, I shot a fantastic partridge, really fast. Uh, very, very pleased with that. Uh, missed a couple of uh, good pheasants and then uh, shot three more. After the mid-morning refreshments, we're soon heading for our third drive of the day. The team of beaters, led by young Matt, is doing a fine job so far, and we're keen to experience some more excellent Burton Agnes sport. On this drive, the birds should flush out of the woodland to our front and head for the homeward direct behind us. Initially, a few odd birds flush early on, and after a long flight through the trees, their energy is expended and are left to pass by in anticipation of more sporting birds to come. As the beaters draw nearer, the birds flush later and sitting on their tails to beat the guns, they offer far more sporting shots. James Richards is the man in the middle of the action here. We last saw him when he was missing a shot at Ptarmigan on a Scottish mountain, but here he's proven he's no mean shot at both pheasant and partridge. James is shooting so well he even takes the cameraman by surprise. All the guns are happy about what is surely the most successful drive of the day so far. The woodcock have been absent until this drive when a pair came my way and passed by safe and sound despite a two-barrel salute from yours truly. Five woodcock from up that bottom. I've already got two, two, two of them, two of them didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. The woodcock that would have impressed me. I didn't notice the left and right, did you? No, I didn't notice. I was just making it up. The third drive we shot this morning was uh, Cheslope. Um, up until that point we hadn't seen any woodcock. There haven't been too many around uh, so far this year because the weather's been pretty mild. But uh, two got up very early and went straight over Peter Carr who um, performed uh, stupendously badly and missed both. Um, but most of the uh, pheasants came out and either went to the left or the right. Uh, I was number four gun and I had one or two over me but most of them went over James uh, to my right who, who accounted for about half a dozen birds and the others went over uh, Jeff Garrett again for some reason. For the last drive before lunch there's something different in store, a corner of Oakwood known as the Birdhouse Drive. Here the birds break back over the treetops to offer fast sporting snap shooting. Wes is the first to shoulder his gun as the beaters blank the birds over into a point of woodland. As it's late in the season, a lot of birds know the escape route and break back low, as does the estate's white pheasant. Young Shep has put an inflated fine of £200,000 on its head, so all decide to look the other way. Here's a woodcock coming, Wes, but let it get up above tree. Another woodcock makes an appearance, but it doesn't offer a safe shot, keeping low and flits by out of the drive. Then the drive proper begins, and Wes hopes his luck will turn. Yeah, it's, uh, that's that fox. Foxes are off limits today, and one lucky Charlie silently slips between the guns. This is a challenging drive, with the trees obscuring sight of the birds until they're right on top of the guns. We managed to bag a few of the testing birds, and all in one enjoy the exciting snap shooting. I don't do enough of it to uh, remember not to overlead them. <laughs> My excuse. The drive soon ends and we inspect the bag. It seems Jeff Garrett has been in the middle of it once again. I shot four nice pheasants there. Uh, Jeff Garrard was on the edge of the wood. Again, uh, all the woodcock this time went to Jeff. Four went over him and uh, four paid the ultimate penalty. With the rest of us wondering how Jeff does it, we retire for the traditional shoot lunch rustled up by Nessie's wife, Sally. By the time we head out for the afternoon shooting, the sun has come out. It turns out the bright weather is more of a hindrance than a help. With sun glare affecting their vision, the guns can't get a good sight on the incoming birds. What's more, aided by a stiff breeze, the birds are real screamers on this drive and test the gun skills to the limit.
There's no doubt in everyone's mind this was a fantastic drive and a credit to the two keepers. I think we had about 10 birds between us on that drive, but it was uh, very, very testing, plenty of high curling pheasants, so it was uh, all good sport. We've got one drive left to provide a suitable finale to what has been a brilliant day, and Nessie, knowing my passion for woodcock, kindly alters the plan accordingly. A final location of the day should show a few of these elusive woodland waders. All are hopeful of perhaps adding one or two of these tricky birds to the bag as we head out to our final stand. Wes, Phil and Jeff seem to have good pegs for this one. They get a decent number of pheasant and partridge and deal with them effectively. Meanwhile, I'm at the other end of the line waiting for my woodcock. I know the pheasant's flight line will favour the other guns, but what woodcock are at home should come my way. A rodeo bursts out of the covert and looks for a suitable exit to quieter pastures. I'm allowed to cover three pegs here, but it doesn't help. But just as I'm giving up all hope, it all happens very quickly and I finally get my woodcock. I was second to last gun and uh, I was covering three pegs but whichever peg I went on the woodcock broke out so five woodcock came out at my side uh, except for, for four of them I was on the wrong peg so I was actually stretching but then thankfully one came absolutely perfect for me and uh, first barrel kill dead in the air. With the day's shooting done we take a moment to quiz our top gun Jeff on just how he managed to shoot so many. Not one for the limelight, he shrugs off the unwelcome attention in good humour. Pretty good day today and probably shot most of the birds today. Yeah, I think uh, I'll agree with you there. Um, it was more satisfying knowing that you was paying for them. <laughs> um, which uh, just spurred me on that little bit more, so uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. OK Matt, I hope we all behaved ourselves today. It's been a fantastic day and thanks so much to you and your dad for putting the day on for us. Uh, it's been a you know shoot for me. That, that I'll certainly remember for a long time. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was good, really. Yeah, you got you, you got stuck in, stuck in early on, and uh, I think that drive after dinner was a bit uh, a bit good for you, really, wasn't it? it was, yeah. Uh, there wasn't a lot dropping. When we got into and they started screaming over there with the wind. Just that wind got up, helped, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it did. Yeah. I know a lot got out when you blanked it over, yeah. but I mean there was still enough in the drive to keep everybody happy. And yeah, they, there was. Yeah. They certainly tested everybody. Yeah, especially Chef. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was struggling like with a 28, 28 <laughs> yeah. bar. He, uh, yeah, yeah. And I think it'll take a while for him to get over that yeah. fact. <laughs> yeah, it will. We won't let him forget anyway. Yeah, put it like that. But thanks again, Matt. Thank you no, so thank much. Thank you. With the day over and Jeff still resisting a ribbon from the other guns, we pack up and shut the door on another fantastic season at Burton Agnes Estate. But Nessie, Matt, and their team of stalwarts have beat his day to plan and look forward to before signing off the season proper. Jeff Garrard there filling his boots, and now the Shooting Show News. This is the Shooting Show News, with the CLA Game Fair less than 21 weeks away. A rise in licence fees may have been cancelled after the Prime Minister himself stepped in to veto them. Last year, the Association of Chief Police Officers pushed for a rise to £92 for the grant or renewal of a shotgun or firearms licence, with the fee rising in line with inflation after that. But David Cameron and Environment Secretary Owen Patterson appear to have intervened to keep fees at their current level. More on the story in the April issue of Sporting Rifle out this week. Basque Scotland has kicked off a study to monitor illegal interference with traps and snares. Using intelligence collected from Basque members, the study will provide a monthly update to the Scottish Government. Basque Scotland's Mike Holliday said unauthorised interference was a widespread problem. Tim Baines of the Scottish Land and Estates Moorland Group added that there had been reports of trap and snare vandalism from nearly all moorland areas in Scotland, no matter how remote. Channel 4 has been accused of a stitch-up after a report it ran on wildlife crime. The SGA's Alex Hogg, who featured in the report, said the broadcasters asked him the same question six times because they didn't like his answer, edited his answers to fit the story they wanted to tell, and produced an extreme report designed to provoke an emotional response from the public. Mr Hogg said he thought the producers had arrived with a fixed agenda and were simply looking for quotes to fit their story. Read all about it on the front page of Modern Gamekeeping. John Hegren took high gun at Friday's Stratstone Super 7 Challenge final, capping a thrilling four months of competition. 
In a tense 20-man final at Royal Berkshire Shooting School, no one shot the 23 targets needed to drive home a supercar. But John and Ed Solomons tied for top spot on 18. After a shoot-off, the man from Bisley Shooting Ground emerged victorious. Full report in the next issue of Clay Shooting. And finally, the EU firearms law debate is escalating after FACE, Europe's umbrella body for hunting organisations, slammed the European Commission's plans to review gun laws. The EC wants to completely rewrite the EU firearms directive, but FACE has heard its plans are based on evidence that is confused, irrelevant or in some cases simply absent. A FACE spokesperson said the Commission was aiming at the wrong target and legal firearms users presented no danger. That was the Shooting Show News. With the practice shots fired and Mark confident with Stuart's shooting, they set out for a day on the hill in the Scottish Highlands. Hi, my name's Stuart Prickett and um, I'm just about to go and have a shot at my first Highland stag. I've just had a few shots on the firing range, make sure I was comfortable with the rifle. Yeah, well, that's perfect. I'm happy enough with that. Yeah, yeah. marvellous. I've done a lot of shooting with um, air rifles, shotguns of different calibres, uh, and a 2 2 rifle, but I've never shot a 270, which is what we're shooting with today. So um, it's quite a bit different. Give it a bit more of a kick than the 2 2, you could say, but um, no, it's, got, it's still getting a nice tight grouping, so I'm happy with that. This is Stuart and Mark's second day out in pursuit of a red stag as a long day yesterday failed to produce a beast. The animals had been even more restless than normal and a full day of stalking took them towards the summit of Glasben Moor where eventually they had to return defeated to the lodge. But today is a new day and the pair set off optimistically. The sun is out and the wind is in their favour. As well as making the stalk tougher going for Mark and Stuart, this warm weather is likely to have sent the deer to the high tops. It's hotter than yesterday, isn't it? Yeah. What we're thinking is we can't really see here just now, mm -hmm. so we're going to cut around the middle ridge here, yeah, right out on the skyline where we were yesterday, and we'll come along the top. I think we'll see that then, where the, the, the stags were. So, Regular breaks to glass the hills make the hike slightly easier. They are taking a different approach today on the same hill, but hoping the herds of reds they saw yesterday will be around the slopes that surround the summit. The journey up is certainly not as steep as the day before and it's encouraging to look back and see how much ground you've already covered. As expected, the weather soon turns and gets colder and more blustery. This adds to the challenge and is all part of stalking in the Highlands. After making a reconnaissance journey alone, Mark reveals that the herd from the day before is still sheltering in the gully as hoped. Several stags are lying on the hillsides around the herd. Their sentry postings will make it difficult to get Stuart and the camerawoman into a good position. Mark decides they should walk past the herd along a frequently trod footpath. Though the deer watch the stalkers every move as they go by, the familiarity of hikers heading along this same route means they aren't startled by their presence. Once out of sight on the other side of the quarry, they make a direct ascent up the hill. Traversing across the slope is the most direct route to the deer and Stuart's best chance to grass a stag, but it's a steep and unforgiving mountainside. They have to tread slowly and carefully to avoid detection as the deer are just over the rise ahead of them. Mark briefs Stuart on which stag to take and they crawl into position. Glassing the herd, he is confident that the deer are still unaware of their presence. Though the wind is strong, thankfully it is blown in their favour. If one member of the herd scents or spots the stalkers, the whole hunt will be over. The stag Mark wants Stuart to take is a mature beast with a shootable head. It is unaware of their presence but lying facing down the hill. It's in an awkward position for the stalkers. Stuart and the rifle are in position, deployed and ready. Now it just looks like a waiting game for the animal to stand up and turn broadside. Mark keeps watch on the other deer in the glen, constantly aware that any one of them could give away the rifleman's position. In the high wind, the stag shows no sign of moving out of its comfortable seat. Mark and Stuart have resigned themselves to the long wait. Not giving up hope just yet, Mark and Stuart stalk further forward. It's a chancy manoeuvre as there are deer all over the hillside it will only take one pair of eyes to give the game away.
With the stag in sight once again, Mark sets Stuart back upon the rifle and directs him to take the shot. The camera just catches the vital moment and the aftermath of the shot, the fleeing herd and the fallen stag. The stag takes a fair plummet down the slope, but thankfully its body and antlers remain intact. I'll just check his eyes and make sure he's dead, but I'm fairly sure he is after that fall. Yeah. Mark harnesses the stag and hauls it into a better position before performing the growler. Watch yourself, Jason. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. With the Grelic complete, they must navigate the stag across the top of a waterfall. This proves tricky to say the least, and one wrong move could lose them their footing and the hard one carcass. Skilly Cole arrives with Duncan the Highland Garen to take the stag off the hill and down to the larder. With the stag securely strapped to the Garen's deer saddle, they make their way off the hill. Stuart's first red stag stalk has finally been a success. So it was, it was Stuart's first ever stag that he's, he's shot, so um, I was quite delighted with him. His, his shooting was quite good at the target before we went out. Um, you know, shot placement on the, the stag was good, it's a long shot. Unfortunately the stag ran sort of 20, 30 yards and uh, took a little bit of a tumble, but uh, you know, that sort of that's happens down here, you can't really help that. Um, but as far as uh, for someone that's not been out on the, 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 sort of the hill in Scotland stalking before, he did really well and um, just followed on and really uh, didn't sort of mess anything up, which is what you kind of hope for. We left this morning and we went up uh, through the glen up towards the top of Enstaroff. As we were sort of heading out towards the, the skyline, uh, where our original plan was to sort of come around on the, above the deer, um, we, we noticed that there was a group of stags up above us on the right. We managed to sneak in underneath them, um, had a bit of a vertical climb, um, sort of stalked in along the face of them and uh, managed to get in. Uh, unfortunately, the, the stag we were after um, sort of walked off around the corner so we had to sort of do a little crawl a bit further in, um, so it was just at a camera shot, but uh, um, we got the stag that we were originally after, and it was actually the same stag that we were after the day before as well, so it was quite a successful uh, day, really. The different approach on the hill this morning seemed to pay off. We uh, stuck to the bottom ridges of the hill once we got up there, it's an experience that I'll never forget, both from the shooting point of view and also the amazing scenery that's up there. It's a great day. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. This has been The Shooting Show.